Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. So, final for the German ground tree today, covering both tier 6 and 7 in one go. Just to clarify for anyone who's new, this is a series where we take a look at every vehicle in a tier, see how it works, and give a verdict on whether it's worth getting, considering, or avoiding for your lineups. It's not a verdict on whether you should research the vehicle itself, but if you should consider actually using it. Anyway, a lot to get through today, lots of unique vehicles, so let's get into it. As always, I really hope you enjoy. First off today, we're starting with the Rakitin Jagdpanzer II Hot, which is identical to the previous vehicle in the line, all apart from the weaponry. This vehicle is aptly equipped with 20 Hot missiles, which are mouse guided this time around, which is a nice change. On top of this, they can cut through a lot of armour at a max of 700mm of penetration. They have slightly less explosive filler than the SS-11s, but still do a lot of damage regardless. However, this vehicle isn't quite as versatile as the previous example due to how the missile is angled. It can't depress very much at only minus 5 degrees, and can't traverse very far to the left or the right, which does make engaging from behind cover a bit harder, as you'll need to find a more precise spot to engage enemies from perfect cover. The missiles are a lot faster this time around, which is sort of a double-edged sword, really. It makes it a bit more viable to use them at long range, as they can reach the target quicker, thus giving them less time to react, but on the downside, it means that you won't have much time to react if an enemy stops or manoeuvres, as the missile just won't have enough time to recalculate. I would honestly say the HOT has less to offer than the previous vehicle in the line. The missile is good, but relative to the BR, the previous SS-11 missiles were good too. And another thing to consider is the other vehicles you now have access to. They're all a lot more versatile at this BR, whereas at 7.7, the Leo and M48 didn't do too well in up tiers due to the lack of stabiliser, which is why I recommended taking the SS-11 Rakitin over the M48, as at BRs where those two vehicles were entirely outclassed, the Rakitin could still work fine, being able to fire from complete cover and all. At 9.0 though, the contemporary MBTs you have function well in up tiers and on basically all maps, so the need to take advantage of the HOT's niche is somewhat redundant here, as pretty much all other tanks you have access to will work fine and really will do better. Another disadvantage is that vehicles on a whole are just so much more faster and more mobile here at 9.0. There's not many sluggish heavy tanks or TDs rolling around which were, to be honest, easy food for the SS-11s. Practically all vehicles at this BR are very fast, which means they can dodge the ATGM a lot easier, and it also means that if you were using any other contemporary tank, you'd likely knock out your enemy faster with a dart than with a missile. The huge penetration power isn't that prevalent either, as darts will still do great against everything really, whereas chemical rounds start to really struggle against space armor and ERA, which is very common at the higher tiers. The only real additional advantage the HOT has is that it can engage helicopters a little bit more reliably. Also, an almost borderline inexcusable disadvantage the HOT has is the inconsistency with how the missile launches. Sometimes, the missile will swing to the left, right, or right into the ground with no input from you at all, it's basically random, which means you could fire off one missile, it flies straight and hits a target, and the second one could fly off to the left and get caught in a tree or the floor, making you vulnerable to return fire. This is one of the worst things a competitive game can do, as in this instance you could play the vehicle perfectly and still get punished for it by something completely out of your control. You can actively lose an engagement by doing everything right, which is indefensible really. It's like if the AWP in CSGO had a small chance of misfiring and shooting you in the foot when you fired it. This might be a legacy mechanic from back when the HOT was one of the top vehicles and very effective, but now that it isn't and made a bit redundant, this feature is one of the worst vehicle-specific issues in the game. Even if it's a historical thing, it really shouldn't be present here as it punishes the player using it when they haven't made a mistake. It's like if they implemented one in every 20 rounds misfiring or the 163 Comet randomly exploding. It would, to an extent, be historical, but it wouldn't be fair that your experience of the vehicle could be ruined by something entirely out of your control. In this instance, you could say, well, just don't play it around cover that could set the missile off, but playing it around cover is really all this vehicle has. If it can only play in the open because of the way the missile operates, it loses all advantages, really. In any case, as far as playstyle goes, this vehicle basically works the same as the SS-11 version, completely cover your hull and engage from behind cover. As if you aren't playing from behind cover, any other vehicle you have access to will take out enemies faster. Also, due to how the missile flies, you can't really play it at close range this time around, as the missile could just fling off and miss an enemy entirely. The perfect spot is mid-range, really, as this gives the enemy little time to dodge the missile. Pros. Good mobility. Good firepower potential. And can fire from concealment. And the cons. Terrible weapon handling. And low versatility. 
The verdict? Well, I will actually say consider it, just for the reason that it works at its best firepower-wise when it's stock. You can take this thing out for its first game and have basically all the firepower advantages from the get-go, which is in stark contrast to the majority of other vehicles here with poor stock grinds. I would in no way focus on getting this vehicle as your main tank, but it can still work as a backup while you're grinding out the other, more effective vehicles. Next up, a very new vehicle, the Radkampfwagen 90, a very mobile wheeled machine with the L7 cannon. All around, this thing is really good actually. It gets a dart round stock, DM23, with an unlockable DM33 round at tier 4 that performs excellently for 9.0. As a light vehicle, its armour isn't hugely impressive in regards to the hull. It's very weak, and a shot into the hull that hits the engine or transmission will generally hull break it, but the turret is actually really, really good for the sort of vehicle this is. It's not hugely well armoured on the surface, but it's full of odd angles and interior plates that will cause even some APFSDS rounds to fail to penetrate. It's still not reliable armour, but it's just reliable enough to be able to take some fire and survive. Additionally, there's no ammo in the turret, so if you are being hit by a dart round, it's very unlikely you'll be one-shot. And due to this thing's mobility, if you do need to back off and repair, you can do so easily. This thing is able to be a lot more aggressive as a light vehicle than some previous examples. Its main drawback though, arguably, is its size. It's a very tall vehicle and one of the tallest at the tier. And as it is a light vehicle with hull brake, being spotted is the last thing you really want to happen. Its turret traverse is also quite slow when compared to other MBTs. At 14.3 degrees a second stock, practically every other non-Russian vehicle beats this speed, which can catch you out, which is definitely a drawback if you're choosing to flank with it. Also, as it is a wheeled vehicle, its close quarters maneuverability is quite poor, as it requires a fairly large turning circle to be able to maneuver, so avoid playing it in packed environments where you'd need to maneuver and turn a lot. Wherever you play this vehicle, I'd suggest trying to completely hide the hull as it will drastically improve your survivability. A shot into the hull if it doesn't hull break you will severely cripple you, whereas a shot into the turret is only going to take out a max of two crew and or your breach. This thing genuinely plays more like an MBT with a weak hull. You'll be playing it and forget to scout enemies just because it doesn't feel like a light vehicle, which is a really good thing as it is a lot more forgiving than most light tanks with all the benefits of them. There's not a whole lot else I can add here really. As long as your hull is hidden, this vehicle will really work anywhere, be it sniping or engaging enemies a bit closer, it will largely perform the same. At range you'll be a lot more survivable but likely not see as many targets, and at close range you'll see a lot more enemies but won't survive quite as long. In any case though, this thing is so mobile it will easily slip into whatever playstyle you prefer. The only thing you need to remember is to hide your hull and try not to engage enemies out of cover. If you do this, even stock, the vehicle will treat you very, very well. Pros. Great mobility. Great firepower. And decent survivability. And the cons. Poor hull protection. What's the verdict? I would easily go for this one. It might take some getting used to, but it's just so effective for what it is. It will always be a great backup, even for the much higher tiers. I can honestly see this thing being bumped up in BR, actually. Whether it does end up going up or not, it will still perform really well, so I really recommend you go for this one. So first for our MBTs this tier is the M48A2 GA2, and unsurprisingly, it's very similar to the M48 in the previous tier. The only meaningful change here is the gun. This thing is equipped with a 105mm cannon with Sabo, Hesh and Heat, and an APFSDS round DM23, the stock round on the previous vehicle. Now, this round is very, very good of course, but that really is the only good thing about this vehicle. Mobility and armour are pretty much identical to the previous M48 at 7.0, apart from the redesigned mantlet, but this change doesn't really have much impact. The mantlet can sometimes catch some Sabo rounds where the armour overlaps, but it's nothing to be relied on. So. The armour is basically irrelevant and the mobility is decent, but you can't really use its mobility to good effect, or at least use it to be aggressive, as the main flaw of this tank is the lack of stabiliser, and at 8.3, that really hurts. Disregarding the French, this is the highest MBT type tank in the game BR wise to not have a stabiliser, which really limits the potential ways to play it effectively. If you were to drive around a corner and meet an enemy head on, chances are very high that you will run into a tank with a stabiliser and a cannon that can cut through your largely superficial armour. 
You can certainly play it a bit more aggressively and occasionally get good results, but this style of play is far from consistent. Another quite glaring problem of this tank is the stock grind. The dart round is a tier 4 modification and you have Sabo stock at 8.3 where you'll likely be seeing 9.3 tanks and at this BR, L7 Sabo and Heat will really stop being effective against most of the tanks we'll be meeting. So, to get this tank into a state where it even has one meaningful advantage, the dart round, you need to go through a lot of modifications and time to unlock it. And even then, the tank is outclassed by 90% of enemy MBTs in regards to versatility and meaningful armor anyway. The mobility isn't bad by any means, but you can't really use it aggressively because if you meet an enemy on equal terms, they will likely get the first shot off if they're aware of you. So you're basically spending a lot of time upgrading a vehicle that will never reliably be able to go toe to toe with the bulk of enemy tanks. It doesn't really have a good lineup either, there's no point maining it as a vehicle because if it gets taken out, you're not really left with any decent backup options. So on its own, all it can really be is a backup, and for a backup it can easily do really well later on in the match, but is it really worth putting so much time into a tank that only works effectively when it's upgraded? It's in a tough spot. To make this thing work effectively though, you do need to be a bit passive, engaging from a stationary position, as this way the drawback of having no stabilizer is somewhat negated, and that really is the only thing that needs to be negated for this tank to really work. Finding a spot at range where you don't need to move to engage your enemies is ideal really. At range it'll take a bit longer for enemies to scope you in, so it should give you enough time to fire on them first. Playing from a static position at close range can still work, but you're obviously a lot more noticeable and easy to hit, so an enemy with a stabiliser can fire on you a lot quicker. So a long sightline is a good option. This tank also gets a decent rangefinder as well that can range up to 3,600 meters on an expert crew, which makes engaging at range even easier. If you have to play at close range though, I'd stick close to some teammates and just follow them around really. The dart can deal with most enemies fairly reliably, so if your teammate starts engaging someone and drawing out their fire, you can pop out, level off the gun, and dispatch them without too much trouble. It's not amazingly consistent to play the vulture like this, but it does still work, especially when you're grinding out the dart round. Pros, decent mobility, and good firepower. And the cons, poor survivability, lack of stabilizer, and poor stock grind. Verdict. This one will be a considerate. It can work as a vehicle, and I actually do seem to do quite well with it personally, but mainly the considerate verdict here is just for the reason that it's actually really, really good in sim. There's one sim event where it's easily the top dog, all you fight are T-54s really. The worst things you come up against are IS-7s in the stabilised Type 59, but everything else you can chew through really. So if this event comes up and you have the dart round and the rangefinder, you can roll through teams. So if sim is your thing, you can have a great time here with this tank. For just RB though, it is hard to recommend dedicating the time to spade it. Next up, a huge change in design, the KPZ-70, the German analogue to the MBT-70. This tank does a lot of things well, it's very mobile, has decent and versatile firepower options, and while it's not necessarily reliably armoured, it can bounce shots and is a struggle to take out for auto cannons. It also features a secondary 20mm cannon on the roof that can cut through just under 50mm of armour on its own, which is great for taking out light vehicles, knocking out barrels and tracks, and wiping out helis. Stock, this thing comes equipped with a standard heat round and a shillelagh ATGM. Both perform fine respectively, but as you start seeing a lot of space armour and ERA around this BR, these chemical rounds do start to struggle. At tier 2, it gets access to an APF SDS round though, with one of the most tedious names in the game, and this round is good. Compared to contemporary dart rounds, it isn't quite as powerful, but if you aim for the same weak spots, you'll largely do fine. Future Oxy here. While I was recording this, the KPZ got a buff. Its reload, which was at a fixed 10 seconds, has been brought down to 6 seconds fixed, which is a huge buff and really takes away the only detrimental disadvantage it actually had. So, really good change. The footage in the background is from when the reload was at 10 seconds, so just keep in mind it can fire faster now. Another change is that it can now only carry a max of 6 of the ATGMs, so keep that in mind too. I will now pass you back to past Oxy. Time is weird. Its survivability as well is a bit of a mixed bag. Darts, ATGMs and heat will generally cut through this thing, but also cannons have basically no gaps from the front to slip around through. It's also very hard for Russian APHE to get through the armour as well. It can get through the front plate, but will mostly get stuck on the fuel tank. So, some vehicles really struggle to get through, and others have basically no trouble at all. The KPZ also only has three crew, so a good shot into the left side of the turret will knock the tank out. There's not really anything you can passively do to buff the armour. 
The side armor is very weak and can only really stop heavy machine guns from getting through, so angling it's not really going to help. However, the weak side armor can sometimes, emphasis on sometimes, work in your favor. A dart round will produce very little fragments that penetrates weak armor, so if you're taking a dart round to the side, chances are the round won't shrapnel too much and won't cause a wide cone of damage if your turret is facing the enemy. As no crew are in the hull, a shot will likely pass right through and not do a whole lot of damage if you have good crew vitality, and also only if you take a few rounds as one of the hull Amorax is gone. So that can't be hit either. So sometimes, if you have to take a shot, it might bizarrely work in your favor to turn the hull side on. This has saved me sometimes, but I can't pretend it's consistent, as it takes advantage of player psychology of, if I shoot in the middle, I'll do the most damage, and the middle of the KPZ is relatively empty if your turret's facing the enemy. This will only work against dart or saber rounds, APHG and auto cannons will easily get through, so I'd only really use this as a final fallback if you can't do anything else. Don't just turn side on as a default. Give it a go once in a while against tanks that only have sabo and darts, and it might actually work out. Another fairly gimmicky aspect to this tank is the hydropneumatic suspension, which allows the vehicle to raise, lower, or tilt by angling the suspension. This rarely has much benefit in battle though, you can use it to get some extra gun depression over hills, but that's about it. You can raise it to cross rougher ground easier, or lower it to make yourself a smaller target, but it doesn't really come into play most of the time. But it is still worth a mention as it can situationally allow you to get kills you otherwise wouldn't be able to get. This is another vehicle that I would class as universally capable in that it has the mobility to get where it needs to in the map and the firepower to deal with basically any enemy if you land a good shot. So doing well in it only really relies on good map knowledge and good shot placement. Just aim to keep the bulk of enemies in front of you and you'll do fine really. It would be condescending if I tried to give any more basic advice. Pros, great mobility, good firepower, effective secondary weapon, workable armor, and versatile. Cons, inconsistent survivability. Verdict, I would easily get this one for your lineup. It works so well at 9.0 and as a backup for the higher tiers if you need it. As well, as the best round is only a tier 2 modification, it won't take long to get this tank working. As it only has 3 crew, it's not the most survivable and will rarely stay in the fight after taking a frontal shot, but it's still very workable, as long as you can click first. Next up, a very recognisable tank, the Leopard A1A1, visually similar to the previous Leopard 1, but with a fair few upgrades. Firstly, the armour is ever so slightly better. It's not really reliable against taking shots, but the turret has some extra plates and some little segments of spaced armour that do sometimes catch some shots. It does protect you a tiny bit better from auto cannons as well, but not really reliably. Firepower is where the main changes are though. Firstly, it's fully stabilised, which is great. It gets a slightly improved rangefinder and access to an APF SDS round, DM23, which at 8.7 performs really well. Annoyingly, as it's a tier 4 modification, grinding it is going to take some time. Unlike the M48 though, the stabiliser and mobility allow this vehicle to be a lot more versatile. The protection is pretty much superficial and unreliable, but even with stock rounds, the stabilizer allows it to potentially get the first shot off, which is all you can really ask for when you're stuck. Because of the mobility and the potential firepower, this vehicle is as well universally capable to the point where doing well in it mainly just relies on map knowledge. The mobility can get you to a good spot, and the cannon will do the rest once you get there. There are still a few caveats to the vehicle though. A common drawback that will get you knocked out is the gun elevation actually, it's very very slow. So if you're engaging an enemy on an angle in the terrain, it will take a few seconds to bring the gun up or down, and considering everything else of this tier is likely stabilised, those seconds where the gun is moving are enough to get you knocked out. So try and keep the gun as level as possible at all times, when driving up or down a hill, angle the gun to match your hull. This sounds like a really trivial thing to do, but it will catch you out if you don't do it. Also, consider picking out a spot that hides your hull. A shot into the turret won't always one-shot you, but a shot into the hull likely will, as it's full of ammo and the spool from a dart round into the front will likely wipe out all your crew. Not always, but generally you will survive a shot into the turret. You'll just lose your ability to fire or one or two crew, but you should be able to reverse off to repair. There is a ready rack in the turret, but it is quite small and rarely hit with enough fragments to detonate, so in any case, I would consider aiming to hide your hull if at all possible, as it will mean you'll occasionally survive shots. It won't save you from APHE though. Apart from this, there's not really a whole lot else to add. You can basically play this vehicle how you like and you will get good results. 
I would consider possibly playing it a bit more passively though, using a ridgeline or some sort of hard cover to engage targets from. Then after you fire, using the very responsive reverse gear to back off out of sight. If you do this at range and immediately reverse after you fire, when the round hits you'll likely be completely out of sight which will usually let you safely pop out and shoot the enemy again. This is a pretty consistent way to play as even if you do miss and get spotted, you are completely safe from return fire so you can drive off and re-engage at a different spot if you like. I've had a lot of success playing it this way but of course this sort of location isn't present on every map so basically just play it in a way that suits you best. But wherever you end up, try and cover your hull if at all possible. Pros, good mobility, great firepower, and versatile. And the cons, poor survivability, and poor stock grind. Verdict, I would get this one. The stock grind is basically identical to the M48, but the stabilizer really lets you get the most out of the vehicle. It won't be too fun getting it spaded, but it really, really works when it is. It's great at its tier and as a backup for the higher tiers too. Just play it a bit carefully and you will do fine. Next up is the Leopard 2K, a pretty interesting vehicle with some familiar and not so familiar assets. The turret is functionally the same as the Radkamp Wagen 90s turret, lots of odd angles etc, but it's a little bit longer to accommodate a 20mm cannon, the same one present on the KPZ-70 which is still absolutely fantastic for taking out the various aircraft you'll be seeing. Its hull isn't amazingly well armoured, it's got a lot of harsh angles that can sometimes bounce rounds, but it isn't really consistent. Its mobility though, once spaded, is great. It's very responsive and can get around the map really, really quickly. The most exciting aspect to it though is that it's the first vehicle in the research tree to use the 120mm L44 cannon, which performs very well. It comes with stock heat, which isn't too bad, but at tier 1 you have DM13 APFSDS, which you can get before parts if you want. This round does perform great. It will struggle with the majority of the armour of the absolute top MBTs, but largely it will be able to cut through most tanks you fight. However, it doesn't get thermals, which does put it at a slight disadvantage at 9.7. Despite having a lot going for it though, it's not a very forgiving vehicle. It's really tall and large and can't reliably take hits, especially into the hull. At this BR, the turret armour isn't quite as finicky, so a lot of rounds will get through. It's still quite hard to one-shot through the turret though. I would honestly play this thing a lot like the Rad Kampfwagen, it basically has the same assets. Good gun, good mobility and workable turret armour. So again, I would aim to hide the hull and play it behind cover if at all possible. It can certainly play on the front lines, rushing in and brawling and you can potentially get some great games this way, but its lack of any meaningful armour when not hulled down really does hold it back, so I would still consider being a bit more passive with this one. Its armour will never truly be effective at any range, but at least the distance you'll have enough time to repair and get back into the fight. Whereas at close range, if you lose your breach or barrel, there's not really anything you can do. It also can't peak corners either really. Some of the more armoured MBTs of this tier can bait shots with their angled front plate or drive out of cover at an angle to rush an enemy into a shot, and this tank can't really do that at all which is another drawback for playing it in a more brawling style. If an enemy is aware of you from behind cover, there's not really any way you can pop out and bait a shot without being penetrated realistically. Unless, of course, you're very, very lucky. The biggest problem with this vehicle is that it's too easy to snapshot it effectively. Most other 9.7 MBTs have some part of their armour that can't really be penetrated very easily, which means you'll have to spend a bit longer to scope in their weakest parts, whereas the 2K doesn't have any part of the armour that can reliably stop incoming shots, so an enemy enemy can afford to fire at you much faster, as chances are wherever the round hits it will critically damage you, and even though the gun is great, against most MBTs you'll have to aim for weak spots or at least one specific section of the armour, be it the hull, breech or lower plate etc, so basically any enemy can reliably cause critical damage to you faster than you can to them, and that's really the main flaw of this vehicle. At 9.7 and above, the turret armour isn't hugely reliable, but it is the safest place to take a hit comparatively, so this is why I'd aim to stick back in cover if possible. It might seem like a bit of a cop-out, but this really is the only way to make this tank work consistently. Because it is so mobile, you can definitely play aggressively and push the enemy team if you're confident. I don't want to just pigeonhole this vehicle, as its mobility is certainly an asset to take advantage of, but you will need to be careful, more careful than a lot of other tanks. So just try to avoid being seen, really. Use the flanks and avoid the common sightlines. Just think of it as a fat light tank, really. Pros, great mobility, great firepower, and effective secondary weapon. Cons, poor survivability. Despite its flaws, I would still get it. It's the only vehicle to bridge the gap between 9.0 and the top tiers, so you'll need it when you unlock the next few vehicles as a backup. 
It's not the best vehicle, but if you're not too aggressive with it, you should get some good results. Either hide your hull or try and stay out of sight, and you will make it work. Next up, something probably a lot more recognisable, the Leopard 2A4. A very nice vehicle, and one that's close to being perfectly suited to the meta. It again uses the L44, but with an unlockable upgraded round, the M23. Mobility is about the same as the 2K, it's slightly less mobile, but not by much. And because this tank actually has some decent protection, it can actually use that mobility. The armour isn't completely reliable, but overall it is a lot better, especially the turret. The cheeks were recently buffed, and now only the Italian CL round the Swedish equivalent, and the dart round on the Leclerc can get through reliably, which is pretty decent protection really. The hull isn't quite as well off though, basically all contemporary dart rounds can cut through it relatively easily. Some heat rounds will struggle though. This tank is hugely capable and versatile, and there's not much it can't do really. The armour stops it from being able to brawl consistently, but it can still do it, the mobility and firepower won't hold you back. Tanks like this at top tier are quite hard to give direct advice for. Because they're so versatile and universally effective, you can just play it how you want and it will work best for you. If you're confident with rushing and being really aggressive, this tank will let you do it. If you want to sit back and snipe, you can easily do that too. The tire armour is great here and you'll rarely be one shot through it. The 2A4 also gets thermals in the gun sight as well, so scanning at range is easier too. The only advice really is obvious stuff. Don't advance too far on your own, don't drive out from behind cover side on, etc. Tanks like these are only strong from the front, so what I'd aim to do is mentally point yourself towards where the bulk of enemies likely are. Just imagine a cone in front of you at all times and try and keep the spots enemies could engage you from in that cone. I appreciate this is a fairly obnoxious concept, but it will help you out and stop you from blindly driving into the map if you keep it in mind. Even if you show a slight sliver of side armour, this thing will go up, so always point yourself right at an enemy. It's annoying to do this, as from playing tanks that rely a bit on armour in the lower tiers, you'll find yourself automatically slightly angling the front plate, but you really need to snap out of this routine when playing at the higher tiers, as it gives the enemy a really reliable shot into your crew compartment. So, even tanks with weaker guns have a chance to penetrate you. For ultimate consistency, hiding your hull and only showing the turret is the way to go. Using a spot like this will mean you likely won't get a huge amount of kills, but it will keep you alive and give you a lot of safety nets. If you get shot, you can back off, repair and give it another go. At close range, you likely won't get a second chance, playing a hull down almost guarantees a second chance. Also, as another precaution, try not to pick a hull down spot that's too close to where an enemy could appear from. Tanks at this tier are so mobile that even if you're around 500 meters away, it won't take long for an enemy to rush you. And if you've got a lot of damaged components, they'll likely make it to you with time to spare. This is how I'd recommend playing it if your aim is to stay in the fight for as long as possible, but the tank is still very capable when it comes to being aggressive and going for the more high risk, high reward gameplay. The gun and the mobility are brilliant combined, which in the end lets you do everything really. This tank will comfortably mould to whatever your playstyle is. Pros, great mobility, great hull down protection, great firepower, and versatile. The cons, inconsistent survivability. Ver uh, uh, we can skip this now, there's no reason to not use this vehicle. You might struggle with it a little bit stock, but once you start getting the upgrades, you can do anything you want with it. Of course, some playstyles are safer than others, but all you really need to do is play to your own strengths. Whether you're a more defensive or aggressive player, this tank will make it work. So, this is Germany's current top tier vehicle, the Leopard 2A5. This is what you have waiting for you at the top of the tree, and it really deserves to be at the top of the tree. While not having the most powerful gun, the quickest reload, or the fastest top speed, it excels in all of these fields enough to rely on basically all of them. And what it can arguably rely on more than most other vehicles is armour. Currently, front on, no tank in the game can penetrate the turret cheeks of this tank, it's entirely immune. The breach and turret ring can still be penetrated, but the turret ring is a pretty small spot to hit, as it does have some extra protection. And the breach, although fairly weak comparatively, will rarely lead to a one-shot if it is penetrated. In terms of other changes from the 2A4, the upper plate of the hull has increased thickness. Now it's immune from almost all stock rounds contemporary MBTs use. The final unlockable rounds they get generally can cut through it, so it's not completely reliable, but a fair few tanks won't be able to pen the upper plate, which is really great. It also gets a new unlockable round, DM33, which works incredibly well and will let you deal with every enemy effectively. The round it gets stock is DM23, the unlockable round on the Leo 2A4. 
Mobility wise, the top speed is the same as the 2A4 again, but it is slightly slower to accelerate due to the extra armour. Not by much, and it will rarely catch you out, but overall it is slightly more sluggish. Additionally, it does get thermals too, but in a much higher quality, allowing you to make out details much easier. And also, it gets thermals in the binocular sight, so you don't need to swing your turret around to sweep terrain, which is a huge advantage, really. As far as how to play it, well, I don't really need to tell you, this is one of the most constantly capable tanks in the game. However you choose to play it, it will work and fit around your playstyle, it's basically like the 2A4, but with way more reliable armour. Just remember the basics of top tier, like avoid driving around corners side on, and drive out angles so you present your front plate first. Another thing you can sort of do is angle your turret as well. This won't change too much, but it does present the enemy with more turret to shoot, and if they still go for the breach because of the angle, the breach and barrel will catch all of the shrapnel pretty much, keeping your crew safe. This isn't something that's incredibly consistent, and you need to be careful not to overdo it, but this can lead to some enemies completely non-penning you, and limiting the damage they will do if they do penetrate. Because of this tank's armour, it works incredibly well hull down. Nothing can reliably take you out in a single shot, so although you might not get the most kills playing this way, you'll certainly be able to stay alive for a long time. But that way of playing probably doesn't sound too exciting, you've just unlocked this incredibly powerful tank and you're going to want to be aggressive and really push it to its limits. But really, that isn't where this tank has the most potential. Although it can work really, really well brawling, I wouldn't really recommend you only play it like this, and that might sound odd considering how the majority of players play top tier. Something worth thinking about in regards to the top tier and how these vehicles work is how they're portrayed in videos and on streams, etc. You'll see your favourite creators usually rush in, play aggressive, and get some great kills, and you might be thinking, why am I recommending that you really consider playing it defensively rather than aggressively? As, let's be honest, it's a contender for one of the most capable aggressive tanks in the game, and you will commonly see it used this way, but the thing is, playing it defensively doesn't make for a good video. It's very consistent, but it doesn't make for interesting viewing, so you won't really see the vehicle used in this way despite how great the hull down protection is. I'm in no way trying to imply that any content creator, stream, or even people making clips on social media don't understand this, but it's just like a snowball effect. People will watch a content creator play it a certain way because it makes for a good video, play it that way themselves, and then players who haven't seen any videos will do the same thing. To the point where everyone plays these vehicles hyper-aggressively just because everyone else does, and you can, in this vehicle, potentially beat all of them, just by playing it a bit more defensively. I don't mean to imply that every single player you'll see plays top tier aggressively, but the vast majority do. It's a bit like the Bulldog we covered a few videos ago. If you leave your mental autopilot on, you'll just drive aimlessly until you meet a tank, and if you find yourself in that position, you're already at a disadvantage. And it's the same here. Except every player has the same mobility, and is therefore most of the time making the same mistake, arguably mistake. The stabilizers make players quite complacent with this. Your gun is always stable and is always ready to fire at an enemy, which is fine, but in this situation, meeting an enemy head-on, your weak spots are likely going to be exposed, be it the lower plate or an over-angled side, etc. This is a perfectly fine way to play, but you won't stay alive for very long. If you just let enemies come to you, you'll likely get the first shot off, and even if you miss a weak spot, chances are the enemy will fail to pen you hull down, and even if they do, you'll likely only lose a few crew and your breach, so if you're far enough away, you can smoke, back off, and re-engage. This tank allows you so many fallbacks to make a mistake, as long as your playstyle is a little bit more on the defensive side. And that really is how you get the most longevity out of this vehicle. And because the mobility is great, and the hull armour, while not completely reliable, is good enough, if your spot isn't working or the enemy team are being pushed back, you can easily jump out of cover and go on the offensive. The vehicle will let you do it and help you do it well. The way I play this tank is I always aim to use it hull down first, and if it isn't working, I can just advance into the map and be a bit more aggressive, or fall back and re-engage at a different location. Your incredible turret armour means nothing if the lower plate is exposed, so in just driving around in the open, you're giving up the one total consistent advantage this tank has. No vehicle in the game can penetrate the cheeks, so in playing consistently out of cover, all you're doing is giving tanks that could otherwise not penetrate you a way to get through your armour and a way to one-shot you as well. I don't mean to present this as a reason to only ever play it defensively, I just don't want you to think that playing it aggressively is the only option you have, as you lose a huge aspect of what makes this tank special. At the end of the day though, it can do everything. It can be aggressive, defensive, and everything in between, so even though I recommend playing it defensively hull down to maximise its effectiveness, irrespective of getting lots of high kill games, you really can do whatever you like and the tank will work for you. It has so many active and passive advantages ready for you to make use of. 
And in fairness, a counterpoint to playing it defensively is that if you're playing the 2A5, you might just be the best vehicle suited for brawling on your team, or at least fighting at close range for control of the map. And in which case, you would honestly be wasted a bit by playing it purely defensively. I would still play it in a way that hides your hull if possible, but if you can see things going south, drive out to the front lines and help the team. The 2A5 has the luxury of being incredibly versatile this way. Pros. Great mobility. Great firepower great survivability, and versatile. And the cons? Eh? It doesn't really have any cons that are unique to it as a vehicle, to be honest. The lower plate is weak, the sides are weak, the breach is weak. Practically every other vehicle has these drawbacks, so there isn't really anything I can fairly put here that isn't a universal drawback all top tier tanks have. This tank is easily worth the grind to get it. It's one of the most forgiving and capable top tier tanks currently, and likely will be for a long time. It's almost perfectly suited to the meta and can do anything you want it to really. No matter what style of play you prefer, you'll be able to make the 2A5 work. Next up, back to tier 6 with our first AA, the Gepard, which is pretty standard for a high tier anti-air really. It's equipped with fully stabilised 35mm Ehrlich and autocannons, with a total capacity of 680 rounds, which is pretty good. A couple of good hits will rip aircraft apart, and due to how fast the turret traverses, adjusting the lead is very, very easy. This vehicle is quite weak though, and can very easily be hull broken. It is very mobile, which does give you some potential to take out tanks with it, but it doesn't have much longevity to be consistent at this. It gets an unlockable belt of APDS that can penetrate a max of 127mm of armour, which is really good, but it only gets a max of 20 rounds per gun in a secondary belt. It's enough to take out a couple of MBTs if you're lucky, but once it runs out it's a lot harder to take out tanks. The API round in the standard belt can penetrate 68mm, so if you have a perfect side shot you can take out some MBTs and light tanks too. It can also rip off barrels and tracks easily as well. If you are going tank hunting, remember to lower your radar dish. This turns the radar off of course, so you can't identify incoming planes, but it makes you much less noticeable as the spinning dish really draws the eye. As far as actual playstyle goes, there's not a huge amount to say. For attacking aircraft alone, stay close to the spawn and out of sight from enemy vehicles, but try not to position yourself directly around around terrain as this can interfere with the radar lock. For going after tanks, either flank really hard and try and catch some light tanks or MBTs on the side, or vulture with some teammates to support them, taking out barrels and tracks, as this way you should get a lot of assists, which will get you enough spawn points to get back in a tank. One other aspect to engaging planes is wait until they're within 2km of you at least before you start firing. The Gepard is a fairly scary anti-air to come up against, so you don't want to reveal yourself until you have a perfect shot. If you fire a burst and miss, an aircraft will not make it easy for you to take them out, so only fire when you're pretty certain the rounds will connect. Pros. Great anti-air ability. Good anti-tank ability. And good mobility. And the cons. Poor survivability and low anti-tank ammo. Verdict? Yeah, of course, get it. It's a huge step above the Kugel Blitz and Oswin 2, and the radar lets you be a real danger to enemy aircraft as well. It can somewhat take out ground vehicles too, but if you can't take them out completely, you can at least milk some assists from them. Whatever you choose to do with it, it's a great platform. Next up is our final anti-air vehicle at tier 7, the German Roland 2, which can be pronounced in so many different ways. Anyway, this is a SAM vehicle equipped only with missiles to take out aircraft. It comes with two types, the stock Roland 1 and the Roland 3. The 1 has a max range of 6.3km, and the 3 has a max range of 8.5km as well as having more explosive in the missile. These missiles can't really be used against tanks reliably though, their proximity so they explode off the surface of a tank's armour. This can knock out barrels and tracks, but not much else. You can technically take out tanks by firing the missile underneath them, but this is very hard to do and not really worth attempting. It even struggles to hull break light vehicles for the same reason. Because of all this, it's almost purely an anti-air vehicle. As one though, it performs well enough. It's great at taking out helis at long range and aircraft too. The missiles can be a bit tricky to aim, but it's only a matter of practice to get the lead down for planes really. There's not really a huge amount to go into with a vehicle like this. To take out a helicopter, you lock it, press fire, and hold the rescue on the aircraft and you'll knock it out. And not much else about that formula changes. For engaging aircraft, if possible, only fire if they're travelling in a straight line, as this makes it much easier to hit them. Additionally, try not to engage an aircraft flying very high above you, 
as it's very easy to lose track of the missile, but this will all come with practice. The only other thing to talk about really is if this vehicle is really worth the grind for you. Its only advantage over the Gepard is being able to take out helis at long distances. The Gepard is more reliable against manoeuvring aircraft than for getting assists on tanks, but being able to take out helis launching missiles from range is a really important thing to counter in the top tiers. But really, all a team needs is one SAM anti-air and the base is covered. It's much less versatile as an anti-air, but for taking out helicopters it's unmatchable really. Pros? Great anti-air ability. Cons? Low versatility. And poor survivability. Verdicts? I'd still get it, but I wouldn't get it straight away. I'd leave it as one of the last vehicles you pick up, unless you think you'd enjoy taking out helis over playing normal tanks. It does its one job really well, but not much else really. Next up, quite a unique vehicle, this is the Bugleit Panzer 57, a very mobile light machine that, like the BMP, fits into more of a support role. It's chiefly equipped with a 57mm autocannon and six tow ATGMs with unlockable eye tows as well. The main gun has pretty decent performance and comes with a few belts. The main ones are the stock AP round, an unlockable APHE round, and a timed fuse shell. The stock AP round is really what you should be using though. The APHE, while very damaging, just lacks the penetration to be reliable, and as the gun fires so fast, you'll easily knock out vehicles with the AP quickly enough. The HEVT shell is mainly used for attacking aircraft, as the shells don't need a direct hit to explode and cause damage. They function basically the same as the shells the automatic uses, very good against helis. However, you can only take two belts. Each belt has 48 rounds, which is a decent number, but if you want to use the HEVT shell, you have to sacrifice half your conventional ammo, which is a pretty big amount, especially if you're having a good game. But you do still have six ATGMs, so even if you were to run out of ammo for the cannon, you can still use those to engage enemies. Generally, just to have maximum viability, I take one belt of AP and one belt of the HEVT, as really, if you use this thing with the intention of taking your aircraft with it, it can function as an SPA somewhat, and that means you've freed up your SPA slot in your lineup for another vehicle. I can't pretend it's quite as reliable as the Gepard for taking out planes, but as it has the laser rangefinder, it's great at taking out helicopters and aircraft flying towards you as well. Vehicles like this work well if you know the maps well, using the less travelled routes, camming corners etc to get side shots, so if you're not quite as confident, using this thing to take out aircraft is a good choice, however, the VT belt is a tier 3 modification so it might take a while to get their stock. As for using it as a tank though, there are a few styles that work quite well. This thing gets thermal, so scoping in tree lines and cover at distances will let you easily spot enemy vehicles. Your main gun won't be too useful here, but the ATGMs definitely will be, so if the map doesn't allow you to engage safely at ranges where your main gun will be effective, this is a good way to play. And you can fall back on the anti-air ability as well. Stick behind hardcover and use the ATGM. The turret of this thing is really small and hard to hit, so if you can hide the hull, it'll become really hard for enemies to even hit you. Where this thing has the potential to get loads of kills though is close quarters. It's more of a high risk, high reward style of gameplay, but this thing chews through MBTs from the side. It can also knock barrels and tracks off enemies as well if you get into trouble. It isn't stabilised though, so if you meet an enemy MBT head on, you'll likely get knocked out. You can't fire the ATGM on the move, so unless you get hugely lucky, this is a situation you want to avoid at all costs. Sticking with your team is a good option too, as you can just vulture behind them. This is especially good when stock, as it allows you to get a lot of assists. Wait until an enemy fires or is distracted and rush out. Use the ATGM and the cannon. And if you can't reliably penetrate the enemy from the front with either weapon, you can quickly blow off the enemy's barrel and tracks, making them vulnerable to your team. At close range, it'll only take around two or three hits to blow the barrel off, which is great. So, if you're on a map you don't quite know very well, this is a good way to play. Pros. Effective firepower options. Good mobility. And versatile. The cons. Poor survivability and poor stock grind. Verdict? I'd get it. It's not going to be the best choice to take out on every map by far, but in the right situation it can work really really well, especially as a late game spawn as usually there'll be a lot more light vehicles to take out, and helicopters as well. It's not quite as easy to use as most vehicles this tier, but in every situation it will have at least some advantages going for it. It just might take some time to spade it and get it to that level though. Lastly for the tech tree vehicles today is the TAM, an Argentinian vehicle, which was the culmination of a joint effort from Germany and Argentina. Despite its designation, it's a light tank. It's very mobile and equipped with a 105, and all the standard ammo options, Sabo, Hesh, Heat, and a final APFSDS round at tier 4. But, as it is a light vehicle, it can hull break and does so quite easily. Now, 
when upgraded, the TAM can be a great vehicle. A little less forgiving than the Leopard A1A1 at the same BR, but it will have a lot more potential just due to how mobile it is. The problem though, is because it's currently the last tank in the line, the module RP cost is insanely high. It's 20,000 RP for a single tier 1 modification, and with the important mobility upgrades and the dart round being tier 4, it's a huge grind to get this thing to a state where it can really excel. And stock, it suffers a fair bit, more than the A1A1, which is a fair thematic comparison here. If you can't take out enemies quickly, you're likely going to take a shot sooner rather than later, and you probably won't survive if you do. And with stock Sabo, taking out enemies fast isn't too easy. Now, the only real advantage this thing has over the A1A1 is the mobility and the scousing function. These aspects are great and work really well in game, but the biggest problem is just taking the time to spade it. It doesn't get thermals either, but it does get a laser rangefinder as a tier 1 modification, which can be really useful if you're grinding as it will let you play as a sniper very effectively from the get-go. Because of this, you have all the assets to be a great scout tank from tier 1, and you can use this to get a lot of assists. It's also a very hard target to hit hull down. The turret is tiny, so sniping and using ridgelines is a great way to stay alive. However, it doesn't have amazing gun depression at only minus 7 degrees. While stock and grinding for the mobility upgrades, I'd consider trying to play it this way, only showing the turret and sniping. This might take some getting used to though, as the zoom in the scope is quite weak, but you do have great potential to just show a sliver of the turret, fire and zip back behind cover to reposition. This thing is a really responsive reverse gear and can travel at around a speed of 50 km an hour in reverse as well. Once upgraded, it works great as a conventional light tank. It's quick and small and will allow you to flank around the map easily. And the dart round, once you unlock it, will let you knock out any vehicle effectively from the side or the front. Before it's spaded, if in doubt, just play it how you play the A1A1, just be mindful that it can't reliably take a shot even when hull down. Even stock, it is fast enough to flank and play that role. The Sabo will knock out tanks from the side if you aim to disable with the first shot and finish with the second, but you will find yourself outmatched by some of the more mobile MBTs even on the flanks. So it's not easy to flank when stock, but far from impossible. Pros? Great mobility, and great firepower. The cons, poor survivability, and poor stock grind. Verdict. It will have to be a considerate, for a few reasons irrespective of its spaded performance. When fully upgraded, it's a great tank, arguably more capable than the Leopard A1A1, but without premium, spading it will take a really long time, and now because of the Rad Kampfwagen, it's put into second place as a backup for the higher tiers. I'd only dedicate the time to spade this one if you want to play at 8.7 or maybe 9.0 for a long time, as if used around this BR, it will do really well. Also, the only reason it has a really high module cost is because it's the last vehicle in the line, and maybe even as close as next update, it will have something else in front of it, and when that happens, I expect the module cost to be rightfully reduced. So if and when that happens, I would easily change this verdict to get it, as I'll be able to get the most out of the vehicle much, much quicker. Next up is an event vehicle, the VT-1-2. A very unique tank, but not an amazingly functional one. The main advantage is the twin 120mm L44 cannons that can fire DM23 and a BR of 8.3, which is great. The left cannon has an autoloader at 5 seconds, whereas the right cannon is loaded manually. Armor-wise, it has around 20mm of structural steel, which works at around 10mm of protection, so this thing does get chewed up fast. Another huge advantage though is its mobility. It has a 2200 horsepower engine, so it can zip around the map at top speed incredibly quickly. The most annoying aspect to this tank is the aiming though. The guns can't slew left or right, so you'll need to use the hull aiming mechanic, which is far from user friendly at the moment. It does take a while to align the guns, which is usually enough time for an observant enemy to knock you out. It's a bit of fun, but it's ultimately a gimmick vehicle and doesn't really have huge functionality. This tank was a past event vehicle from one of the crafting events, and it's on the market currently for around 40 to 50 Gaijin coins. However, it isn't a premium, so I wouldn't really recommend getting it. It can be really satisfying to get kills with, but most of the time it will be quite tedious, and you don't really want to pay for something that has no grinding potential and isn't going to be consistently enjoyable to play either. So even though it does look quite cool, it's not worth your money really. Lastly today is our premium, the ever-popular Leopard A1A1 L44. Like the name quite adequately suggests, it's the Leo A1A1 with an L44 cannon. However, unlike the regular A1A1, this version gets access to a full laser rangefinder and thermals for the gun sight. It gets access to entry-level ammunition for the main gun, DM13 and DM12, same ammo as the 2K. 
Basically everything else is the same as the A1A1, although the face of the turret is slightly weaker so auto cannons can rip through it a bit faster so watch out for that if you do end up playing at close range. As we've covered all aspects of this vehicle in some way or another, there's no need for me to waste your time retreading ground, I'd play it exactly the same as the A1A1 in the tech tree. Again, staying at range is great. You get no extra advantages by playing this vehicle at close range, and with the L44, you get thermals and a laser rangefinder, so engaging over distances is even more reliable this time around. And not to mention the obvious extra performance of the gun as well. So, the only real question is, is it worth it? And annoyingly, I'm going to have to say... Yes, it is. It sort of goes against my general advice for how to play this game, but it really just is a perfect premium vehicle on its own. It will work on every map and every battle rating. There will never be an instance where this tank has nothing going for it. It can research every tier of vehicle effectively. The pack also comes with 15 days of premium and 2,000 golden eagles, which for 60 euros is good really. Annoyingly so, as although I personally think you'd miss a lot of the best parts of the game by buying this and just rocketing your way up the tree, it would be dishonest of me to not say that this vehicle is the most effective premium you have access to regarding versatility and performance and researchability. It isn't hugely forgiving though, so if you're a new player who isn't quite familiar with the maps, you might not have the best time straight away. This tank doesn't have any passive advantages really to help a new player out. A passive advantage would be armor, for example. You will need to do all all the work to make this vehicle function properly, so although it has the most potential to grind through the tree, as a product though, it does what it says on the tin, you will get your money's worth out of it if you play to its strengths. I still wouldn't recommend you go straight to buying this thing though if you're very new to the game. Play around in the low tiers and get the hang of the maps, and if you really want to boost your research, then go for it. It is a very capable machine. First for our aircraft is the Premium Seahawk Mark 100. It isn't the fastest plane, but it's very manoeuvrable and can carry a fairly versatile loadout, carrying bombs, RP3s, or both at the same time. Its max load is 16 RP3s with two 500 pound bombs, which will make it quite sluggish, but if the air is clear it'll do a lot of work. It is expensive though, and I wouldn't recommend you buy it just for the cast potential alone, so if the pack ever goes on discount, or you want it for grinding out the air tree, it will work in combined battles very well. Next up is our first heli, the Alouette 2. Quite a primitive helicopter, but it can still work. It carries four 7.62 machine guns and four SS-11 AGMs, which are mouse-guided. It's not very fast and can't really defend itself, but it is agile, and if you can sneak up to some cover, the missiles are pretty effective. So, for 8.3, it fills the role of a reserve heli very well. Next up is the G91R3. This version of the G91 comes with two 30mm cannons and can equip four Nord AGMs. They function a lot like bullpups but aren't quite as powerful. They can either be dumb fired in a straight line or controlled with the keyboard and flight to make them a bit more accurate. It takes a while to get used to this but once you get some practice in they work incredibly well. And even without them the G91 is a great fighter, it can take out aircraft quickly and can stray flight targets too. This one really is one of the best. Next up is the Mi-24P and its premium variant, which is identical. It's a fairly sluggish heli, but can withstand some machine gun fire and comes with countermeasures. It can take four AGMs and two AAMs, as well as some rockets as well. I wouldn't say it's worth paying for unless it's on sale, and it's not the easiest aircraft to use. It doesn't get many AGMs and they're not very easy to aim either. If you manage to get it on a discount, it might be worth picking up, as you could use it to grind out the heli tree. It's not the best, but far from the worst. Lastly is our final heli, the Eurocopter Tiger UHT. This version doesn't get an autocannon sadly, but it can carry stingers and two types of AGMs. Hot 3s that can cut through a max of 1,250mm of armour and fly straight, while the other can penetrate 1,000mm of armour but comes down from above like the Hellfires. And as the camera for the weaponry is positioned above the rotors, you can hide behind cover in the terrain and use the fire and forget missiles to attack targets. Not all maps offer this cover, but it can work great if you find a spot. It also of course gets thermal imaging and the lock, so it can function very very well. It is a huge grind to get it though, so although it works great, I wouldn't really set your heart on it unless you have premium and a huge amount of time to set aside for the grind. Lastly is something a bit more achievable, the MiG-21MF. This version can carry four S-24 rockets which do huge damage if they hit. The MiG-21 can also use the ballistic computer. To use this, toggle the radial menu by pressing Y, hit 3 to bring up weaponry, and then 2 to turn on the computer. This gives you a little X where the missile will land, making it a little bit easier to engage targets at range. It won't always work as missile anti-air can still get you before you even get close, but it does work when undisturbed and can be laser accurate with the computer. 
So there we are guys, really hope you enjoyed the video. On the screen now are what I think are the most consistent lineups you could make uh, for tier 6 and 7. There's a lot of room to kind of add more stuff in and change the aircraft and that kind of thing, uh, but this is what I personally use, this is what I personally have the most success with. So yeah, really hope you enjoyed the video. And that's it for Germany, well sort of, there's the addendum afterwards which will cover uh, BR changes and particular bugs that were fixed, that kind of thing. And maybe something a bit more interesting if I can actually get the time to do it, uh, we'll see. So I hope you liked it, hope the audio wasn't too annoying, and I hope you're all doing well given all the odd things that are going on at the moment. You don't need me to tell you, but just, you know, don't take any risks right now, nothing is worth dying for. Well, probably, anyway. Uh, <laughs> hope you guys are doing as well as you can, and hope the grinding event isn't killing you at the moment, that's exactly what I'm going to be doing after I finish editing this. So, um, yeah. Ah, oh, just spilt peas everywhere. There's peas everywhere now. Well, I'm gonna go and <laughs> I'm gonna go and clean up these peas. So um, I hope you enjoyed, and um, I will see you next time. Goodbye. Jesus.